folks, I've got a co-host today with the Quiet Light Podcast, Mr. Wozniak. Welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast co-hosting duties. Oh, thank you so much for having me. We've kicked you, Mr. Doust, to the curb. He doesn't listen to the podcast, so I can say that. Mark is gone. He's out. It's just Mr. Wozniak and myself now. Kidding. All, all kidding aside, he's here forever. He's a lifer. He did found the company, so he should be a lifer. We've got a, a very special guest for the third time today, folks. It is Stephen Spear from e-commerce lending. Chris, in the past, Stephen and I have talked about uh, you know, SBA loans for buyers and what they have to do to get one and, and the benefits of it and the financing aspect and all these different things. Today, we're going to flip the script a little bit and talk about what to do to prepare your business uh, so that you qualify for an SBA loan and you have uh, more buyers um, uh, available or able to buy your business. What's the upside to uh, to having more buyers uh, be qualified to buy your business, Chris? Well, it's it's huge. I mean, I, I tell every seller, if there's any chance we have, let's try to get you SBA pre-qualified because, you know, you're talking about a much smaller pool of buyers that may need all cash to buy your business. Um, if we can find buyers that need maybe 10 or 20% down to buy your business, you can imagine the, the pool of buyers expands dramatically. So, if we can get you pre-qualified, it's a huge win out of the gate. And there's there's just so many nuances to, to getting your business prepped uh, to get pre-qualified. So I, I really strongly urge any seller that's that's thinking about it that really doesn't know what the SBA is and doesn't know what lenders are and, and how that's all intertwined to just take 30 minutes and listen. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, if you want to get maximum value for the business, um, prepping it to be uh, SBA qualified or pre-qualified uh, is going to open up to more buyers and the more buyers that are interested in your business and can buy your business, uh, the closer you're going to be to your financial goals and uh, definitely get a better deal structure in most cases. So um, let's go to it. Let's jump to uh, the podcast with Mr. Spear. Here we go, folks. Steven, welcome back to the Quiet Light Podcast. How are you doing? Doing well, Chris. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Great to have you on. Absolutely. Yeah. Chris, good to have Stephen back for what, the third time, Stephen, I think? It is a third time. I think the this first is... was 2017 or 16, maybe. Yeah. You were one of the early guests on the podcast. That was a long time ago. I, I had less gray hair back then. I think it was taller I too, was... but nobody can tell. <laughs> Super handsome, no joke. <laughs> I think well, I was Stephen... 20 pounds more. <laughs> we've all changed. Uh, and that's why we've got uh, Wozniak on the uh, podcast here, folks, because he's younger and better looking than Stephen and I. And we needed to bring some, you know, fresh blood here uh, for you younger entrepreneurs that are just looking at us old guys going, what are these guys now? Uh, but he, listen, this is what we're going to talk about today. We've had Stephen on in the past talking about, uh, you know, preparing, I mean, uh, uh, how to buy an online business with an SBA loan, something that was critical uh, back in uh, 17, all the time, actually, because the deal structures changed. And now with the aggregate aggregators, uh, it seems harder and harder to buy an online business uh, and fight against the aggregators because they're jumping on stuff really fast and can pay all cash. As Chris and I have always said, it's, it's, uh, it's an extra 45 days maybe to wait, 60 days to wait to close. And there's two upsides to it. A, the um, SBA loans, you know, 90% of them close. And I know you have to wait an extra 60 days maybe, but the upside to that is that you also get an extra 60 days worth of uh, revenue and profit, uh, plus probably a better deal structure. And we'll get into that a little bit because today's podcast is actually about how to prepare your business for uh, the SBA loan process so that you can have a broader base of buyers, uh, whether it's an aggregator for an FBA business, they are going to content sites and Shopify stores now or DC stores, uh, but also for any kind of business, whether you're SaaS or content or e-commerce, to just make sure you're gonna get maximum value on the best deal structure when you sell your business. Now, Stephen, on this podcast, we're gonna talk about this um, a little bit more, but why don't you give us a general overview of uh, how to prepare a business for, uh, you know, uh, thinking or why somebody should prepare the business to think about preparing it for the potential SBA buyer. You know, as you know, the, the main thing is uh, the key word is prepare uh, as opposed to just, oh, I'm going to, I want to sell my business. 
it's all about preparation, not only from the aspect of selling the business, but also to um, set the business up for a successful as- exit and be able to um, essentially have the largest um, net profit at, at you know the largest check possible upon exit. And part of that is to be able to position the business in a way that when you go to exit, it qualifies for financing. You know, ultimately, especially at the higher price points, you know, it's very rare to have individual or or even a collective group just stroke a check for an acquisition of a business that's you know a million, two million, three million dollars. Is it that's and your that's definition of a higher price point? Is that two, three, four million range? Is that what you're thinking? I'm sorry, you said on that higher price point, and then you actually defined it for me. But you're thinking, yeah. you know, two, three, four million would be where you think uh, we start to see not uh, all cash deals. Um. Right. Excluding, you know, the aggregators that, that you mentioned earlier. Well, um, yeah. Some of them fight cash. for, they say all cash, Chris. Right. Uh, but yeah. then, <laughs> and their emails, Stephen say all cash, we'll pay all cash. I've even seen one that says we'll pay all cash. And if you're under LOI with somebody else, we'll beat that by $250,000. And we were under LOI with that aggregator on a deal and they did not pay all cash and they were haggling in due diligence like crazy. None of it was math and logic. It was just doing it for the sake of doing it. And uh, so what they say is not always the truth. So with SBA loans and SBA deals, you may end up with a much better deal structure, like mostly cash, I guess, what you're getting at, Stephen, right? Exactly. And, and also, I mean, aggregators definitely played their part. But at the end of the day, you want to open up your business to as many potential buyers as possible. Supply, you know, basic supply and demand. The more buyers, generally it pushes the price point up, and and that's why it's important to position your business for exit from a financing perspective. And um, unfortunately, most sellers don't do that. They, uh, you know, back to a couple of points you made, for example, in your book, you know, they just decide to sell, and they're really not ready to sell. They don't, they haven't prepared for exit, and usually that takes time, right, Joe? I wrote a book. What book are you referring to? Oh, wait, I did. Yeah, this just, book right here. Just for clarification, though, Chris, I'm I'm no Walker Dival, right? I haven't I haven't done no, my Walker stuff. No one is. <laughs> Have you seen him lately, Stephen? No, he looks I think like he's on permanent he, sabbatical. No, 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 no. He's going. He's going. He's going out to to shows and events, and he looks like he's auditioning for a role in a Tarzan movie. His hair is is so long and down here. Anyway, sorry. I know Walker yeah, I that do. you you don't listen to this. Somebody might have the clip and be sharing it with you, but uh, <laughs> you're fun to make fun of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to position the business for sale. I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say just Stephen, kind of taking a step back. One thing I've kind of noticed, which is strange with my sellers, is and it's made me kind of reflect on how I'm uh, proposing SBA financing to them. But <clears throat> one question I kind of get, or, or a theme is. And I've, I've realized this is a lot of sellers when I kind of talk about SBA financing, I realize they don't understand exactly what it is, like from a real basic premise. So like they'll say things to me like, um, you know, what is SBA financing? You know, I think I'd much rather get cash at closing. And it's like they, they, they're thinking that some type of loan uh, where they're not going to get cash at closing. And I've realized I have to explain this better, like really, because they don't they have no clue what the SBA financing is. And they also think they're getting money from the SBA, um, which is not true either. What's, what would you say to sellers? Um, I mean, I, I know the answer, but what would you tell sellers to educate them on that? I think the key is just telling them that it's essentially a buyer obtaining a, a loan to acquire their business. And the loan's not from the SBA. The loan's from a lender who happens to have uh, the loan's partially guaranteed by the SBA, Small Business Administration. So oftentimes, and that's kind of something that comes up quite a bit in conversation that, that we have here at e-commerce lending is that they think that the loan's coming from the SBA and it's not. So it's essentially a loan coming from a lending institution that happens to be guaranteed or insured against default. But at the end of the day, the seller does get a sizable check at closing. Uh, with very a lot fewer strings attached than maybe uh, an aggregator type deal, um, so it, it's really a win-win. And 
you know, generally they get more money at closing. So if they're willing to wait an extra, as Joe mentioned, 45 days to exit, um, you know, it's, it's, most people would do that for an extra couple of hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, let me say a couple of things first in regards to aggregators. I'm going to agree with you, Stephen. They've been very good for the market folks. They've uh, really exposed the idea of uh, being able to sell an online business uh, so much better than we have. Uh, we've been around for 14 years. These guys have been around for four and now everybody knows you can buy an online business or an FBA business. That's something we struggled to get across people's minds for a long time. And second, Chris, as far as the, um, you know, hey, I'd rather get cash at closing than do an SBA deal. I, I, I've come across the same thing. And it's almost like when you see a piece of, you know, some real estate for sale or you're selling your home and, you know, somebody comes to the table and they're making an all cash offer. Well, at the end of the day, that person that's, you know, making an offer with financing it's all cash as well. It's exactly the same. The only difference, there's two differences. One, probably the all cash offer is lower than the other offer because they literally are using all of their cash. Um, the, that's the downside. Um, the upside is you know, with a loan offer. The, the only other issue that people have great fears about, is, Stephen, is that you know, like with real estate, that person wouldn't be approved for the loan. Uh, but with your process, you get everybody pre-approved. And that's what we do at Quilight. Chris, you would never go under LOI without, you know, on an SBA deal without having the buyer pre-approved already from a lender like Steven, correct? Yeah, the buyer and, and the seller pre-qualified for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, Steven, let's, let's get right on track into how to, you know, what, what things you've got to do uh, to prepare your business to get the best value uh, on an SBA loan. So give us some idea on what, what, uh, entrepreneurs, owners of businesses can do today to make sure that when they do go to sell, that they'll be able to qualify for an SBA loan? You know, and, and to answer your question, I think, you know, what are the biggest challenges in that happening? You know, one, books that aren't clean books, They're, the financials are a disaster. And unfortunately, you know, we see that quite a bit. And I think primarily because sellers, when they establish, let's just say an FBA business, Amazon business, it's kind of more of a mom and pop, you know, extra revenue stream kind of approach. And then it just evolves over time and they really get behind the eight ball with their financials, um, you know, be it their P&Ls and balance sheets and, and tax returns. And that's the biggest challenge from a lending perspective is that um, oftentimes the, the financial information provided by the seller to us is a disaster. So what's what your, we try to do is what's your definition of disaster though? Are we talking about people that just don't do a good job in QuickBooks or they commingle three different businesses in one, you know, LLC and tax return? I mean, that's that's always hard, commingling of financials. How do you deal with separating those out? If somebody's done that and they've got a business that's four years old and another that's six and they're trying to sell the older one, but it's all under one LLC, one tax return. Is that even sellable with an SBA loan? It is. And, and that's, I, I would say, you know, in terms of ranking, that's one of the biggest problems. That's the biggest problem is commingling of businesses. So you have what a seller have to, with- What do they have to do if it's too late to fix that? If they're ready to sell now uh, and the best buyer is an SBA buyer, what do they have to do and when do they have to do it? Well, if they have to sell immediately, that's not going to happen from a financing perspective. But if they have a little bit of time, they hire a CPA and they start having their financials delineated into what's called consolidated financials, meaning the revenues and expenses of each business, each of the businesses are delineated onto kind of a formal format by a CPA, not a bookkeeper, but by a CPA. And then from that standpoint, we're able to move forward. And we have quite a few deals that we've had to, had to inter, you know, intercede and get in there and help that CPA along the process. But at the end of the day, those deals ended up getting approved and closed. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. To I'm sorry, Joe. Um, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Okay. I was going to say, I'll speak to that. I've, I've given, um, Stephen and I have done a, a handful of deals this year and I've given you some doozies on about half of those, Stephen, uh, that had um, pretty complicated financials. Even the last deal we just closed and, you were able to help kind of guide us with um, 
kind of a template for the letter of delineation and then kind of a, an accompanying spreadsheet that that uh, gave you the visual of what the letter of delineation was trying to explain. So it is, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from firsthand experience. It is possible. Um, and Stephen's gotten them done where there where the financials were not uh, exactly clean. So and that that. Right. That letter from the CPA when they delineate everything happens after being under letter of intent, and it just adds to the amount of time and due diligence and ultimately to closing, Stephen? Well, what we do is uh, when we pre-qualify a business, I've, you know, we've pre-qualified several of Chris's businesses. We, um, you know, we're told, hey, just so you know, there is commingling, and then Chris will provide us with P&Ls that have that delineation. And that's a good starting point to be able to pre-qualify the business with the understanding that once we do go under LOI, a formal consolidated financial statement needs to be provided by a CPA. So, um, so any broker is, is knows that, uh, and any seller knows that once he or she's under LOI, that they need to you know, hire a CPA and have those financials formally delineated. Yeah, we did it with uh, Ramon's business years ago when we sold it as well. And everybody's heard the story about Ramon in, in terms of his exit. Um, Chris, you've never had a P&L with you know, a lot of ad backs in it, right? Uh, people don't write things off in Q4 you know, when they're buying Christmas presents for the family, right? You've never seen those, have you? Never, never, never seen a cash, a tax return on cash basis. Never seen that before either. So, yeah. Yeah. So they're all kind of messy and a little, I mean, it's, it is what it is, but uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I learned early on, Stephen, in working with you is that your team will actually, and, uh, and actually in underwriting, they'll uh, do a little bit of an ad back schedule to, it's not the bottom line number on the tax return necessarily. Sometimes there are some pretty crystal clear ad backs that you can adjust for as well. Right. And that's the second biggest problem is when somebody's writing off everything they could possibly write off in the business and it dramatically lowers their tax burden, but also makes the business less sellable. How do you address some of those issues? I mean, you're right. So it's not just the bottom line number on the tax return. We do um, have quite a few ad backs, especially in the online space. And oftentimes we have a discussion with the broker of what those ad backs may be to be able to, uh, to utilize those. And um, you're right, sellers get really aggressive with their tax returns. They run every single personal expense through them. So it's our job with the seller's help and sometimes even a CPA to really start figuring out with, with, what those add backs are and be able to, to add them back. Um, sometimes actually we've had it where we've consulted a seller with his or her CPA and, and actually amend their return. Um, it's pretty, it's not entirely uncommon for us to, to do that, to say, listen, I know you're aggressive. I know you may have to write a, a, you know, write a check to the IRS, but this might really work out well. I mean, back to your point, you know, that you've always said, you know, choose your pain, you know, and, and ultimately if you're willing to write a check to the IRS, but get tenfold out the back when you go to sell a business, you know, most people would do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'd love to, I'd love to agree a hundred percent that most people will do that, but oftentimes they're just, they're afraid of the unknown, right? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, um, an uninformed mind always says no. I used to say ignorant mind, but a few people got insulted by that. So I, now I say uninformed, um, <laughs> but that's the point of having conversations like this. Steven, other than, you know, cash, there's SBA financing. What other types of alternatives are there for people that are selling an online business and not, and it does matter people if you're the seller of an online business, because you need to prepare your business to be sold to a great buyer at a great price. And that great buyer may be, you know, in need of financing. And so if you've done a good job with, you know, a, a proper P and L accrual accounting, as, as Chris said, and uh, you know, proper uh, add back schedule with someone like Chris and myself helping you, it's going to help you get to the bottom you know, line goal that you're, you're trying to shoot for. But are there um, alternatives to SBA lending, Stephen, or is it prime, you know, in your view and your experience, is that primarily, um, you know, the alternative to cash? 
And that question comes up a lot, Joe, and, and there really isn't an alternative to SBA financing. The main reason being there's, there's no collateral on these deals. It's simply cash flow lending and traditional lending requires collateral. So that's the biggest challenge. And um, so there, there's no there there. You're, you're selling a business based on its cash flow uh, and you're buying a business based on its cash flow. And generally there's no collateral involved. So really it, it, it's SBA financing, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. As you know, SBA financing allows for pretty significant leveraging. Um, so you know, oftentimes we have clients that can pay cash, but choose not to because they're looking to you know, build a portfolio of businesses. So if they, if they pay cash for one deal, they're not gonna be able to have enough liquidity to buy other, other businesses. So they do utilize SBA financing to be able to build that portfolio. So there are a lot of attributes to SBA financing and, and uh, another attribute is it's very cheap money. Um, so um, if you're willing to wait a little bit um, longer for closing, and if the seller is willing to wait a little bit longer, then it's definitely the way to go. Hey, Stephen, from a borrower's perspective, you, you mentioned you may have a buyer that has cash where they could actually do the deal with cash, but they choose to leverage their money and, and use SBA. From a um, net worth perspective, uh, a buyer's financial situation, what are, what, what's, what are SBA requirements and limitations from that regard? Because I know we recently did a deal where the buyer was so strong financially, his balance sheet was so strong and it actually, you know, you'd think opposite, but it actually made the deal a little more difficult um, at the beginning. So could you talk about that just a little bit? That's a really boy, good point, Chris. Every once in a while, we have a, a buyer who is extremely liquid. Uh, for example, he, he's trying to buy a $2 million business and he has $7 million in the bank. That, that's a problem because what the SBA does, even though they don't, they're not the ones um, lending the money, they do have their own guidelines. And if they feel you could easily pay cash for a business without major impact to, your, to one's lifestyle or, or, um, or otherwise, they won't, they won't allow a lender to, to lend to that person. So every once in a while, we do have that situation. We've had it twice this year. Um, there are ways to navigate through that, which, um, you know, I discuss with buyers, but for the most part, it could cause a problem. That's kind of crazy to think about. You get 7 million at the bank, but you don't qualify for a $2 million SBA loan. It's, you know, one yeah. of the best pieces of advice I ever got was on the golf course and I was slicing and hooking and I'm not a very good golfer just to be clear, but it was from Walter and, and it's my wife's uncle. Um, he's been my mentor for years, very successful entrepreneur. But he said, set up a, a line of credit. You know, if you're in business and you're an entrepreneur, you're going to need a line of credit someday. Uh, and you want it already set up when you're ready to take action. And in this case, if you're buying a business, that person that's got $7 million in the bank, he should have all sorts of lines of credit set up, whether it's a HELOC or with the bank or with his investment advisors, whatever it might be. So if you haven't done it already, folks, I'd definitely advise that you do that. Uh, Stephen, if for sellers, when they want to say, okay, I'm, you know, we talk to them about preparing their businesses and getting trained for that exit. And that's why the book is out there. That's why Chris is here to help people with valuations and help them along this journey. Uh, SBA wise, what, what do they do? What do they do to begin that process to make sure their business is qualified for an SBA loan from your point of view? Yeah, so they'll come to us typically anywhere from six months to two years prior to exit. And then we request their financials and we, we, do a, a pretty significant, you know, forensic audit of them and go back with recommendations. And it, it may be, you know, it may be as severe as, you know, you should consider amending your return to, hey, you know, moving forward from this point forward, be less aggressive on your taxes, run less personal expenses through. Um, it, it could be a myriad of different things. Um, in some in some cases, uh, we have people outside the United States wanting to get as much, um, you know, as much for their business as possible. And in those cases, we recommend them actually uh, domiciling their business here in the United States. We had one seller, he was Australian, and that's exactly what we recommended. He ended up doing it, uh, gosh, four, three and a half years ago. And he exited last year uh, with a very nice, uh, 
you know, very nice reward at the end of it all. But part of that planning was for him to take his Australian company and domicile it here in the United States for at least two years. And then his business ended up qualifying for SBA financing. That's a mature entrepreneur right there. Somebody that's going to think that far in advance, take some time and experience to do that. Chris, how often do you run across folks like that? Well, we actually, Stephen and I just had a call. Um, what was it, Stephen, like a month ago? Um, he's, our seller was in the UK and the same thing. He has yeah. a very sellable business, but it's just in the UK and we couldn't get it sold. So he actually, I, I kind of rolled the idea out about SBA, but it was kind of a long shot and I didn't know how he would react, but he ended up kind of reaching back out to me and said, Hey, Chris, what, I mean, do you think it's possible if I had, you know, X amount of years of tax returns in the U S do you think we could eventually get SBA financing and get this thing sold? And I said, yeah, I think so. But let's, let's get Steven on the phone first. Cause I, I really wasn't sure I hadn't dealt with a overseas business that had proposed that question to me before. So we, um, we got on a phone call with Stephen and Stephen kind of walked him through it. And yeah, that's the case. I mean, two years of domiciled U.S. returns and we can get it pre-qualified. So it's, what, are, it's, what are the hoops to jump through to have a, a U.S. entity if you're a U.K., Australian, New Zealand resident? I, I see that question on forums and I see a dozen different answers. What's your view on that, Stephen? How do you, how do you recommend people do it? Well, first off, I, I never give out tax advice. Um, obviously, I'm not a CPA, nor am I a CPA in the UK. But I, I set kind of the, gui the kind of the guidelines from a lender's perspective, and then they go back to their uh, accountant or CPA, and they're able to get those wheels in motion. It's not as hard as you think, and it's not where they're getting double taxed. Um, there is a way to be able to formulate it where you're not uh, subjecting your business to more taxation. So um, I don't get in the weeds on that, but I know that, you know, we've been successful in being able to consult our, our seller clients to, uh, to put that in place and, uh, and have a successful exit at the end of the day. So you deflect is what you do. Don't, I, I'm not an attorney. I can't give you that advice. I'm not your yeah. bookkeeper. I know that's what we do too. Right. You can't yeah. give advice where you're not, you know, you have to qualified. I agree. You have to, I mean, it's a day. Day. so yeah. <laughs> I agree. And, and, you know, and yet, I mean, how many legal questions do the two of you get on a daily basis? Probably all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. It's accounting questions too. So yeah. Accounting yeah, questions, saying. legal questions, and uh, you know, you could give some sort of opinion, but at the end of the day, you know, I always, I always say I, I'm not an attorney or I'm not a CPA, Yeah. but here's my opinion um, because obviously we don't want to get, you know, uh, I don't play one on TV either. And, um, you know, I, obviously we're not, we're not in a position to give out legal or uh, accounting advice. Of course, of course. So if Chris and I are in the valuation process with a company and they want to end up getting uh, the best possible deal at the end of the day, preparing their financials properly um, would be one of the recommendations. If they don't have an e-commerce bookkeeper. We're going to recommend get an e-commerce bookkeeper and flip your cash accounting to accrual. It's cheaper than a, a lease on a Tesla, folks. It's so much better than doing it on your own. And uh, actually, I don't know what the lease is on a Tesla. I guess it depends upon the model. Uh, it's worth doing. Let me just put it that way. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than having an in-house bookkeeper. And then that person is going to be able to just hand things off to your CPA, which is going to be great for tax returns. But if you're co-mingling, then you're going to have to have your CPA uh, do some work as well. Um, so CPA is going to have to, you know, separate them out. As uh, Stephen mentioned, you're going to need to hire an, uh, a bookkeeper, preferably e-commerce bookkeeper, uh, and uh, definitely, you know, accrual accounting. Uh, once they've done all that and they've got it buttoned up, Chris and I, Stephen, um, we know the process, right? We're listening to business and so on and so forth. But what what do you see as the next steps for somebody when uh, they're going to list to the business with Quiet Lighter? any other firm for that uh, uh, purpose uh, if they want to maximize uh, their exit and get an SBA buyer? Well, I mean, part, you know, we do that consulting up front and then um, it's kind of ongoing during, during, you know, let's just say they do it a year out. It's ongoing. And then at the, at the end of it, then we pre-qualify the business formally issue a pre-qualification letter. So, um, so it quite light. Uh, broker can put it in with uh, with the business summary, 
and, um, and list that business as an SBA qualified business. And a lot of buyers, one thing I will say, a lot of buyers, when they look through those, um, those SIMs, they, um, they look for that SBA eligible or SBA approved um, um, indication on the SIM. They do look for that. And oftentimes, if it doesn't have that, they'll move on to the next business. So it really kind of, it, 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 draws, it draws buyers to your listing if you have that listed. Yeah, I agree. We, 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 we start putting it right at the, uh, on the teaser, right, Chris? Uh, oh, yeah. So that people see it online. And if they're, if they're simply looking for SBA uh, pre-qualified businesses, they'll see it right on the, on, the, on the listing page. Chris, if you've got something that's SBA pre-qualified versus not, um, have you tracked the volume of um, uh, downloads of the SIM uh, and uh, the uh, number of LOIs versus none or number of calls that you have with buyers? Just ballpark numbers? Would it be? Yeah, I don't have specific stats, but anecdotally, I'd say it's two, two or three to one for SBA pre-qualified versus not. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I, and so what I explained to all my sellers, you know, if we can get you pre-qualified, it's a very basic thing. It opens up the, the pool of buyers tremendously because if it's a million dollar business, you, you can either be looking for the one buyer that has a million dollars cash. And if, if you do find a buyer that has a million cash, I always, it seems like they want to leverage their money and buy a business that's 5 million. They don't want to pay cash for a million dollar company, at, at least in my experience. So I explained to sellers, it just opens up your pool of buyers because they may only need 20% down. They may only need 200,000. And Steven, I was going to ask you, What's your thoughts on, as far as from a borrower's perspective, um, equity injection? Is that, do they have to come with a certain percentage of cash of the deal to get it done? Or is it, can, can there be other um, structures that, that can be considered injection? There can be other structures that consider injection. I mean, ultimately, the minimum amount that a buyer will have to put up is 10%. Uh, there's no way around that. So of his or her own money. Um, and the rest could come in form of a seller note. That's very common. We've had clients where they quite don't have the 10%, but they bring in a business partner that does have it in, in exchange for an equity stake in the business. So there are ways to getting, of getting that done. Um, but So that kind of gives you an idea. But in terms of equity injection, it does, the bare minimum allowed or required by the SBA is 10%. But as you move up the food chain, you know, move up to you know, two, three, four million dollar acquisition, that number does go up. Um, and generally, anywhere from a two million to a five million dollar acquisition, it's going to be anywhere from fifteen to twenty percent buyer injection okay. of the buyer's own money. Well, this may great. Uh, there's, there's so many different nuances to it. Uh, for sellers and for buyers. But the most important thing I think, folks, is that you actually get started so that you won't don't wake up someday and decide to sell because you're just emotionally spent and you need, need to get out. Because at that point, it's almost, it is too late in, in most situations yes. to get maximum value, to find the best buyer if the best buyer is an SBA buyer and you haven't done this work in advance. So both buyers and sellers uh, can reach out to you, Stephen, to get themselves pre-qualified as a buyer or the seller. If you want to send Steven your details and see if your business is already pre-qualified, if not, he'll tell you what to do and how to fix it. Same with Chris, same with myself. They know how to reach us, Steven. How do they uh, reach uh, you and, and connect with you if they want to get their business pre-qualified for an SBA loan? Well, they can email me at Steven and that's Steven with a PH at e-commerce lending.com. Um, that's for on the seller side. Uh, on the buyer side, they could either email me at that same email address or go on to our website and uh, and com- and schedule a call with uh, with one of our team members. And that's uh, ecommercelending.com, right? It is indeed, yes. All right, we'll put that in the show, show notes as well. Uh, Chris, any last questions you want to ask Stephen or are we good to go here? I think we're good. Well, can, can I ask one more question? Of course, sure. it's your show. Sure. Um, so, Stephen, can, can you talk a little bit of, from a seller's perspective as we get towards the end of these deals and they're getting close? What's your thought on the, the bulk transfer requirements from the lenders and the kind of the, the no tax due certificates? Because sometimes when we as we get closer toward the end of the deal, those those certificates and those transfers and things getting things back from the state, they can add 
you know, 10, 15 business days to the deal. Is there anything sellers can do kind of ahead of time? I mean, I know it's the lenders ask for that at the time they ask for it for a reason, but is there anything they can do preparation wise to kind of plan for that? Yes. And, and we, we preach this um, right at LOI start, uh, start working on that. Unfortunately, we, we say that, but oftentimes sellers kind of drag their feet and don't get it done. But um, you, we front load it right at LOI, start working on that uh, because that is coming up more and more on deals and it can delay deals as, as you and I know um, firsthand, Chris. Um, but especially if it's the state of California, yeah. they're way behind the eight ball right now. So yeah, bulk sale transfers, get your attorney involved, get that going immediately upon LOI and there shouldn't be any issues. Yeah. yeah. Just do it yeah. Quiet, right? I was going to say it was California last time I had a, an issue with that. There's there's so many issues with you, California. Just get 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 in line and straighten out. Come on, you're making our lives difficult here. Good luck um, with that. <laughs> it's like with everything else. Don't delay. You know, don't wait. Right. Don't put it off until someday. You're going to wake up and someday is here and it's going to be too late. So, sellers, reach out to Stephen at Stephen at e-commerce lending or go to ecommercelending.com. You can find him there. You could even probably find him on LinkedIn, but of course we'll put it all in the show notes as well. Stephen, I appreciate you uh, joining us once again on the Quiet Life podcast. We'll see you at the next event. It's been a pleasure, Joe and Chris. Thanks for having me on. See you, Steve. Good talk to you.